Hello, beloved. Blessings to you, Kyle Searcy here. Very honored to come before you with the Word of God. Uh, just today, something just dawned on me. It just rose up in my spirit. It touched me. It, it came at me like a ton of bricks. And I want to release that Word to you. I'm so excited to be sharing with you. Man, the Word of God is just so rich. It's so powerful. It's so life-changing. It's so transformative. And I'm glad we're getting this time together. As usual, notes are available for you to download and begin to go over and study and teach again. I really want you to begin teaching these notes. All of our small group leaders, get with your group leaders, go over these notes, ask questions, dialogue. But those of you at work, with your family, with your young children, just take it and break it down and teach these notes. They go deeper into your spirit, they impact you in a greater way, and you'll have a chance for them to be a blessing to somebody else. So do, do me a favor, go ahead and download the notes, go over uh, the notes with us as we're doing it, and share the stream, invite somebody to be a part of what you're about to hear. That means you're a media missionary. You don't know who needs to hear this word. You say, I don't know you're going to preach. Well, whatever I'm going to preach, I'm telling you it's from the Lord. I heard from the Lord. Something just dawned on me, and I'm going to release it to you in just a moment. It's going to be a blessing. So go ahead and share the stream and let somebody know that we are here, and it's going to be rich. It's going to be really rich. Now, first of all, I hope you're doing really well. Hope things are going good in your life. I hope your faith is strong. I hope your, your outlook is optimistic. I hope that doubt is gone from you. Despondency is leaving you. Anxiety is fleeing from you. I hope that you're enjoying every moment of every day. That's kind of what I want to talk to you about uh, in a certain way. But I, my prayer is that you're doing well. And I am praying for you. And our church is praying for you. Say, you don't know me. Ah, we're praying for you. We pray every, every day from 6 to 7. And again, 6 to 7 a.m., 6 to 7 p.m., a prayer line, one that you can actually get on. Then I have my own personal prayer times in addition to that, where we're praying and we're allowing God to pray through us. So we are praying for you, and we believe God for you and believe the best for you. And I just want to decree over you, good things are coming your way. Now, I want you to hear me. I'm not, no, I'm not playing. Good things are coming your way. As I say that, you feel a witness coming on you that says, yes, that's right. But then don't let that doubt creep in after the witness comes. I decree and declare over you good things are coming your way. I'm prophesying to you. I'm not just, I'm prophesying good things, God things, transformative things are coming your way. Get ready. The Lord is going to begin to increase you in wisdom and increase you in many different areas. Uh, uh, there's some of you out there listening to me. It's like you've been through a season of testing and trying and you've passed and God says, I'm coming. I'm coming with gifts. You know, it's a season where people are thinking about the mythical creature, Santa Claus and all that, who's bearing gifts and bringing gifts and he's checking who's naughty and nice. But, but here's the moral of that fake story. Moral of it is if you're worthy, if you're deserving, you'll get gifts. Well, here's what I sense God saying. And not based on any Santa Claus myth, that was just an uh, illustration or analogy. Here's what I sense God saying. Some of you have passed the test. You have passed the test. You have done well. You have overcome. You've made it through. So God said, I'm coming with gifts. I'm coming with gifts. I ain't coming from the North Pole. I'm coming from above. And I'm coming from your spirit. And I'm releasing through the angelic realm and through my spirit gifts and graces and establishment and open doors. All right, stop. I'm setting things in place, I hear the Lord say, and I'm coming, and I'm coming in a way. So if that word is for you, just receive that, because I sense the Lord uh, mightily saying that to somebody. So be encouraged. You've done well, and now it's time for your reward. Can we just say thank you, Lord? Thank you, Lord, for doing that. Thank you, Lord, for hearing. Thank you, Lord, for seeing. Thank you, Lord, for honoring the sacrifice that we have laid down. Wow. Now, that was unexpected. I don't usually do that, but right now I want to get to the message. The message I have for you today is a message with three words. I call it L3, love, laugh, and live. Love, laugh, and live. I heard this clear as day. It came as an admonition, and it came as a declaration as to how we ought to live our life. So to help us get through and understand what this is really all about, I introduce my friend Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. He wrote Song of Solomon. He also wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote Proverbs. But in Ecclesiastes, Solomon was on a quest. And he was on a quest to find out what's meaningful in life and what's good in life and what life is all about. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse number 3, it says, I searched in my heart how to, great, how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I made me works 
of the great works, it says, I built myself houses, not a house, but houses, and I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. Solomon was on, he said, I made me waters of pools to which water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants. I mean, the brother had servants, he had houses, he had pools, he had strings, he had everything, good. he had it going on. And I had servants born in my house, yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all that were in Jerusalem before me and also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. And I acquired male and female singers. The man had his own orchestra. He would go to sleep and be serenaded at night. Solomon had it going on in the lights of the sons of men and musical instruments of all kind. So I became great and excelled more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. And also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. This was my reward of all my labor, he says. And I looked at all the works my hands had done, all the labor which I had toiled. And indeed, it was vanity, grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Profundity. This is amazing. It is profound. This is realistic. Solomon had wisdom he had. He wanted to seek and search out of life. Where is life? What gives me life? What gives me a sense of fulfillment? What fulfills me internally? What is it really all about? So he says, you know what? I'm going to try pleasure. I'm going to try mirth. I'm going to try partying. I'm going to try substance. I want to try things. Uh, so he had gold. He had silver. He had houses. He had pools. He had servants. All the things that people in life kind of really want and seek after and look for and go after. There's some people out there that are saying, if I could just get a better house, I know I'll be happy. If I can just get, you know, a job where I've got everything I need and I'm able to make, you know, $150,000 a year, I know I'll be happy when that begins to happen. If I could just have this and have that and have relationships. Well, listen, Solomon had a thousand women, 700 wives and 300 concubines. He had a thousand women. He had more money than you and I will probably ever see in our lifetime. He had fame. Uh, He was a leader. He had he had it going on. But he said, when I looked at everything I had, when I checked out everything I had, when I examined everything I had, it was vanity. It was grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Wow. That word profit actually is a Hebrew word, yatron. It means benefit, yield, success, advantage. Shalom said, I had all this stuff, and many people would look at me and say, I'm a success, but I had no success. It was not successful in my eyes. I did not feel successful. It wasn't advantageous to me. What do you mean? All that stuff you had, you had houses and you had your own orchestra. It wasn't, no, 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 it wasn't advantageous to me. It wasn't beneficial to me. It didn't really yield the results that most people think they will yield. So what was Solomon's conclusion of the whole matter? He had two basic conclusions. One conclusion was to love, laugh, and live. That's my paraphrase on it. Because he said in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24, Nothing is better for a man that he should eat and drink, and that his soul should enjoy the good of his labor. Now listen, here's a man seeking and searching all over the world for everything, for for what fulfills, for what life is, for where life really is. And here's what he said. Nothing is better. Nothing is better. Not substance, not drugs, not alcohol, not illegal sex. Nothing is better than a man that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in all of his labor. And here's another verse. Ecclesiastes 2.24. This also I saw was from the hand of God. From the hand of God, he said. Now, Ecclesiastes 3.13 says this, And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor, for this is the gift of God. Now, are you getting the pattern here? Then in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18, he says, Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all of his labor, which he toils under the sun, all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. The Bible says the word heritage 
It's the word heleg. It means possession, booty, territory, property. So what Solomon was saying is that I sought for the meaning of life and things and possessions and all this stuff that people think they need to have. And I couldn't find it there. What I really found is what we ought to do is enjoy the fruit of your labor. To simply enjoy what you put your hands to. In other words, love, laugh, and live. In other words, we need to learn, my friends, how to suck every morsel out of life. We need to learn how to never have any bad days. We need to learn how to make the most of everywhere we are. We need to learn how to be content wherever we find ourselves. We need to learn how not to complain. The Bible says, do all things without murmuring and complaining or complaining and disputing, it says in one translation. God wants us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He wants us to put on beauty for ashes and oil of joy for mourning and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. God talks about the way we should live our life. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before thy God? There's a way believers ought to live. There's a way we ought to carry ourselves. There's a way we ought to comport ourselves. There's a way we ought to enjoy every day. We ought to be the happiest people around. We ought to be the most joyful people around. One of the fruits of the Spirit is this thing called joy, and joy ought to be our portion. But here's the problem with so many people. They're waiting on something to complete them. They're waiting on something to make them. They're waiting on something to make them happy. They're waiting on the promotion, waiting on the job. They're waiting on the money. They're waiting on the husband. They're waiting on the wife. They're waiting on the child. They're waiting on their family. They're waiting on some guy to die in their family who's old now and who's got some money he's going to leave to them. They're waiting on uh, the, the, the po political climate to change. They're waiting on this and waiting on that. And no, no, if there's one thing that Solomon teaches us is that there's something that we need to learn to do, and that's innately, innately enjoy the very fruit of our labor every single day. In other words, love, laugh, and live. In other words, life is, life is complete regardless of what we have. Life is complete regardless of who's in our world. And yes, there are some things that we might want and some things we might need, but Solomon's saying you can have everything in the world that you would think you need and more of it than you think you need, and it's still vanity. It's grasping of the wind. It's empty. It ha it's nothing to it. It's not profitable, which means you make your own happiness. You make your own reality. You make your own joy. And I just heard this, and I feel like God's saying 2020 has been a year filled with a lot of negativity and a lot of difficulty. But even in the midst of a year like 2020, every day could have been a day of joy. Every day should have been a day of joy. If it wasn't, we can move into 2021. Love, laugh, and live. Let's talk about it for a minute. Let's talk about love. What is this thing about love? Love works no harm. The Bible says love works no ill to its neighbor doesn't do any harm to its neighbor. That word harm is a word kakos. It means evil or wrong. Love does not work harm to its neighbor. So when you're walking in love, when you put on love, when you're carrying yourself according to that spirit of love, we wouldn't do any harm to anybody. We wouldn't want any ill on anybody, even people that do harm to us, because the Bible said, love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that despitefully use you. If we would embrace love, not many things in our life could ever go wrong. And especially people that we may want to harm or feel like harming, love will keep us from doing that. Love also covers sins. The scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, and above all things have fervent love one for another. The love will cover a multitude of sins. Now, the Bible says our love should be fervent. I love that word fervent because the word fervent, it, it, it's like a, a word that means deep. Uh, in Greek, it, it's a unique word. It's like a word where you stretch or strain. It's actually used to describe the taunt muscles of an athlete who strains or win a race. He's doing a 400-yard dash or a 40-yard dash, a 400-mile run or whatever it is, a 400-kilometer, whatever I'm saying. He's running, all right? He's running. And he's trying to get to the finish line, and he's straining his muscles. That's what it means. And the Bible says, have fervent love among yourself. Strain to love one another. Do everything you can to walk in love. Do everything you can to embrace this force called love. Love is a force. It's a power. It's a grace. It's something that, it's who God is. God is love. And when we walk in love, when we act in love, we're actually walking in God and acting in God. And the Bible said, have 
fervent, strain to have love, put it on, do it, have love upon yourself because love covers a multitude of sin. The word cover is the Greek word calypto. It means to hide and conceal. Love is so powerful. It covers wrong. It covers sins. It covers things that people uh, do wrong. In other words, it's not saying that you hide sins from God and it's, uh, that's not the point, but it's like you don't look at that. You don't look at the bad. You don't look at the evil. You look at the good. And uh, boy, do we need a world where people look at good because there's so many people looking at the bad and so many people looking at the evil and so many people looking at what people do wrong. We need somebody to rise up and look at what's good and love will cover and conceal and hide. It's not trying to expose. It'll hide and cover. Love will look at what somebody does wrong and still love them and lead them to Jesus instead of dog them out and judge them. That's what love will do. And we need to walk in love because love has a way of guarding your heart and covering your emotions and keeping you from being introspective. It keeps you external. And when you're external, you will be a blessing to the lives of many. When you walk in love, you treat others as you want to be treated. That's what you end up doing. Walking in love causes others to be treated. In fact, the Bible calls it the royal law. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do that, you will do well. That's what the book says. You'll do well. Hallelujah. We need to learn to love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. And if anybody's to manifest love, it ought to be believers. Why don't you make 2021 and beyond a year that you pursue love and walk in love and allow God to grace your heart with love to a new level? Love shows mercy. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan where a guy came to Jesus and asked him, what's the greatest commandment and all that? Love the Lord the God with all your heart. Came in there somewhere and they said, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. They said, who was my neighbor? So Jesus wanted to teach him a lesson. He talked about a Samaritan who was hated by a Jewish person who fell among thieves and was wounded and stripped and left on the side of the road. And a priest walked by and a Levite walked by and somebody else walked by, but then a Samaritan. Samaritan, a hated person, came and took him and poured oil and wine in his wounds and put him on his horse and took him to the end and said, keep him here, nurse him back to health and I'll come and I'll pay again. He said, which one was the neighbor to him? The one that did him kindness. He said, go and do thou likewise. Love shows mercy. Love gives a guy on the side of the road who's got to sign up a dollar or two or maybe five. That's what love does. Love overcomes offenses. Love forgives when it needs to forgive. Love looks for ways to, to put cold water on people's head. You know, the Bible talks about, it says, when your enemy hungers, feed him. When your enemy's thirsty, give him something to drink. Because by so doing, you heap coals of fire upon their head. In other words, you overwhelm them. You give people what they don't deserve. I had a chance to do that recently. Somebody did something to a vehicle that I have that just really, really made me upset. Almost could have messed it up. Certainly delayed me going somewhere for about an hour, hour and a half. And it was so, you know, I, I was, I, I was, I, I could have been really mad and really upset. And in the beginning, I was disappointed. I was really disappointed. But I remember after a while, it took about an hour, hour and a half to get this vehicle ready for what I needed to do. And during that time, I said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to act in a different spirit. And instead of being mad and instead of fussing at the people, which I could have done because I was paying money to get some things done and everything was done wrong. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go above and beyond. You know what I did at the end of it? I gave a generous tip and I was pleasant and I was, I had a smile on my face and I, I wanted to overwhelm them because the world needs love. It needs people that show mercy. That's what the world needs. Now, I don't always get that right. I'm not trying to set myself up as a model of mercy. I got a ways to go because sometimes I get mad. Somebody cut me off in traffic and I want to chase them. You ever had that happen to you? You ever want to chase somebody before? Well, come on, you feel me. You know, so I, I'm not saying I'm a model of it, but hey, that day I did right. And I'm trying to walk more and more in love because I want to represent the heart and the character of God. We need to walk in love. Love is so powerful. It's so amazing. In fact, we owe people love. We owe it to them. Owe no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. We owe it. It's a debt. We owe people the ability to love them. In fact, love is perfection. Colossians 3, therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing one another and forgiving one another is what it says. Bearing one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all things, put on love. Listen to this. Are you ready for this? I don't think you're ready for this. You ready for this? 
which is the bond of perfection. That word bond means like glue. It means like glue. So put on the glue of perfection. Put on the bond of perfection. That thing which causes you to be mature in Christ-like. You know what it is? It's love. It, it, it's, it's the glue that binds you to being about as perfect as you can be. And the Bible makes that clear in 1 Corinthians 13, that if you want to be perfect, if you want to be mature, it's going to take love to do that. 1 Corinthians 12, the gifts of the Spirit. And then 1 Corinthians 13, it says you can have so much knowledge that there's nothing you don't know. You can have so much prophecy that you speak in tongues of men's and men and angels. You can have, uh, you know, you could have so much money, you give gifts to everybody. But if you do not have love, here's what the Bible said, you're nothing. It profits you nothing. You are nothing. Then it goes into what love really is all about. So love really is the killer app. We need to embrace it. We need to walk in it. It's the, it's the, it's the manifesto of the believer. How will that manifest in a politically charged climate? Could you love a person who's of a different political persuasion than you? Could you love a candidate who's of a po different political persuasion as you are? Can you pray for a candidate? I, I remember, uh, the, the, you know, there are people who were just saying, I'm not going to pray for so-and-so, and I don't like so-and-so, and I'm not, no, come on. Where, where's love in that? Okay, where's love in that? How about, you know, what if there's some things Jesus didn't like about you? Should he do that? Should he just like, I, I ain't going to pray? I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to protect angels, leave them alone because I don't like how they voted. I don't like what they mean. Come on, that's not the right spirit. Got to begin to walk in love. Yes, we have standards. We will not bow to the standards. We will not bow to the truth. We will proclaim the name of the Lord. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the spirit with which we do things. And even when we speak the truth, we have to learn to speak the truth in. Yes, you got it. Speak the truth in love. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It's not provoke. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know that when you walk in love, that helps you. It helps you. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they will cease. Whether there be knowledge, it will vanish away. And you realize that? So love helps you. Love suffers long, but it's kind while it's suffering. Oh, that helps you. Love endures all things. Love believes all things. Love bears all things. Love, I, I, I look at love like armor. When we really have love on us, it puts armor on us where certain things just will not penetrate us. It'll, 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 it'll ricochet off of us once it gets on us. Man, my prayer is that you and I learn to walk in love. But here's the second part of my message. Not only love, we got to learn to laugh. Life is better when you're laughing. No, I mean it. <laughs> Go on. Life is better when you're having fun. Would you rather be in a house with somebody who's always mean and grumpy and angry and you're walking on pins and needles or well, you laugh? Even when you mess up, you laugh about stuff. You laugh at each other instead of fussing at each other. A lot of the things husband and wives fuss about, a lot of things couples fuss about, a lot of things parents and children fuss about, they're laughing matters. They really are. We get so tight and we get so stressed out and there's so much that goes on in our life and there's so much stress. We're always tense and we're always, no, oh, man, you got to learn to laugh. Here's what George Martin said, laughter is poison to fear. When you laugh, even fear gets defeated. Here's what somebody else said, there's nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. Here's what somebody else said, don't know who said it, but I like it. I've not seen anyone dying of laughter, but I know millions who are dying because they are not laughing. I've not seen anyone dying of laughter, but I know millions who are dying because they're not laughing. Don't let that be us. Proverbs 15, 13 says, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but sorrow of the heart, but by the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Do you hear that? A merry heart, a joyful heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. When you allow sorrow in your heart to stay there, even grief, there's been a lot of death and a lot of loss. And I encourage you, do not overly sorrow. Do not overly grieve. And you are in control of that. You are in charge of that. You're the one that determines how much you grieve. You're the one that needs to begin to talk to yourself and say, they're in a better place. I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to be the one to just keep being selfish about this. I don't want to do that. I don't want to live that way. I want to be the one to rejoice in where they are. And yes, I miss them, but I'm not going to just, just ruin my life because their life is gone. No, no, by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. We need to learn to be light 
Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. Do you know that? Let me, let me ask you a question. What do you, what do you think Jesus is like and was like? What do you think he is like and was like? What kind of a Jesus was he? Was he always serious, sober, always waiting for the disciples to mess up so he can beat them up? Was he mean and stoic and mad and frowning his face all the time like he drank vinegar? I don't think so. I don't think so. Let me tell you what I think. I think Jesus was joyful. I know he is now, and I know he was on earth. Because there were times he would actually have fun with his disciples. He would call, nickname them sons of thunder and bohaginers. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9 says this, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, lawlessness, therefore God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. He has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. You know, Jesus is anointed with the oil of gladness more than anyone else. He has more joy than anyone else. He has more excitement than anyone else. He is, he is a happy guy. You go to heaven and see him, he's not gonna be all mad and all stuck up, he's happy. When he was on earth, he was happy. And I wanna be like Jesus and God himself. God laughs from too. There's a verse there said, why do the nations rage and the people post or plot a vain thing? And the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers to take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let, them, let us break their bonds and let us cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens shall laugh and the Lord shall hold them in derision. Hallelujah. And he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. <laughs> he who sits in the heavens will laugh. The greatest army in the world amassed against Jesus to destroy him. And God in heaven is having a belly laugh. When trouble comes, God doesn't stress. He relaxes. And when trouble comes, we don't need to stress. We need to learn to laugh. So we can't let stress, anxiety, depression, uncertainty steal our joy. God wants us to die happy, to be happy every day of our life. Do you know that laughing lowers blood pressure? Did you listen to me? You know, that medicine the doctor prescribes you, that's not the only thing that lowers blood pressure. Laughing lowers blood pressure. Laughing reduces stress hormone levels in your body. The stress hormone levels, cortisol and all these other stress hormone levels that cause you to be wired up and tensed up. When you laugh, it reduces those in your body. You know it improves your abs. You go ahead and keep doing crunches and keep doing planks and keep doing sit-ups. So you can just laugh because when you laugh, your abs get a good workout. So come on, work them out by laughing. I just saved somebody a gym membership. Come on there. Hallelujah. Love, <laughs> laughter improves your cardiac health. It makes your heart more healthy. It boosts your T cells, your cells that, that, that build your immune system. Laughing will help you overcome COVID. You know that they've actually done studies where they people who have been sick, they have laughing sessions where they just laugh for 20 minutes or laugh 30 minutes or laugh an hour and people have laughed themselves back to wholeness. Come on, man. It triggers the release of endorphins. Endorphins are the feel good chemicals in our body. They make you feel real good. And when you laugh, endorphins are released and it produces a general sense of well being. It really does. So we got to learn to laugh. We must learn to laugh. In order to do that, you have to give people the benefit of the doubt. Stop letting people get on your nerve. Get your nerves out of the way. Tuck your nerves in. Tighten them up somewhere. Oh, they get on my nerve. My boss get on my nerve. I can't stand working here. I can't stand that man. I can't stand that woman. Get out of the way and learn to laugh. Or sit back and ask yourself, I wonder what's really going on. I wonder what's happening in their life. I wonder why they're so unhappy. I wonder why they're always grumpy. I wonder what's happening. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they, you know, maybe they have issues. Maybe they need to pray. We can just learn to laugh at that. You know, my boss yelled at me today and she yelled at me for no apparent reason. Don't get stressed. Laugh at all. Say, God, I know I'm doing this job under you. You told me to work under you. You told me whatever my hands find to do, do it with all of my might. So I want you to learn to give people the benefit of the doubt. Because by doing that, we can learn to laugh. Yes, we can learn to laugh. You ever been in an argument with somebody and they said something that was crazy in the midst of an argument? Both of y'all just busted out laughing. It changes the dynamic of things. I mean, it really does. I remember a guy years ago, Francis Fran Japan. He's a great preacher. He lives out in uh, Iowa somewhere. And he, was, uh, he had a house for people, like homeless people he would bring to live in the house. And there was this, this person in the house who would just, just blank out. 
this person would get in blank stares and just stare at somebody for like hours and not even blink. I mean, it was a weird thing. It was a demonic thing. So one day this young lady got up and took a frying pan and hit him upside the head. And there was so much strife in the house and he would preach a sermon against strife and then people would argue about the sermon and it was so much strife. And he said, God, what do I do? You got to help me. And the Lord gave him a verse in Colossians that said, sing into yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So he went back to the house and made a rule. He said, from now on, nobody's allowed to say anything in the house. We're just going to sing. So they had dinner that night. And instead of saying, would you pass me the butter? They had to sing it. Would you pass me the butter, please? Thank you. Did you have enough chicken? Thank you. <laughs> and through, la- through singing, They started laughing at each other. They started laughing at the tones and laughter broke the spirit of strife. And I'm telling you, laughter will break the spirit of strife in your house. Laughter will overcome the spirit of strife in your life if you allow it to overcome the spirit of of strife. So we got to love. Got to learn to laugh. But we also have to learn to live. Got to learn to live. What do I mean? Live your life to the full. Live your life to the full. Stop waiting on something to live. Stop waiting on the degree. Get the degree, but enjoy while you're in school. Enjoy while you're at the job. Yeah, you're driving Uber and you're trying to make a little extra money or you're working on Uber Eats or you're working on DoorDash and sometimes people might give you a $1 tip for a $100 order. Laugh. I said laugh because somebody else might give you a $100 tip for a $10 order. Don't let it get to you. Gas prices are high. Don't let it get to you. Somebody gave you a gift for Christmas that you wanted. Don't let it get to you. No matter what is going on, I want you to learn to love, to laugh, and to live your life to the full. Come on. John 10, 10 says this, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he wants to do. Steal your joy. Kill your spirit. Destroy your life. But he said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That's what the book says. You feel me? Am I talking to you? Am I preaching good? Got to stop waiting on things in order to live. Stop letting others keep you from living. We need to live from the inside out, out of our spirit. Here's what I want you to do in 2021. I want you to work on every single day, every single day of 2021. I want you to work on loving. I want you to work on laughing. And I want you to say, today I'm going to live to the full. I'm going to enjoy every minute. If I eat some chicken nuggets from Chick-fil-A, I'm going to enjoy every single one of the nuggets. When I dip them in that Chick-fil-A sauce, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to chew it slow and I'm going to enjoy it. Man, if I go to Tropical Cafe Smoothie and I get my smoothie, I'm going to enjoy every slurp from that smoothie. I'm going to suck the marrow out of every conversation. I'm going to drive home from work and I'm not going to get stressed out in traffic. I'm going to love, I'm going to laugh, and I'm going to live, and I'm going to enjoy every single moment of it. That's what I'm going to do. Oh, man, I hope you can hear me. This, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is God. I feel his pleasure all over it. Most of the troubles we have are troubles we allow inside of us. But if we would have these three centuries standing at our gate, love, laughter, and life, then so many things would be better in our life. There's a poem by a guy named William Ernest Henley, and here's what it says. Out of the night that covers me black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever God's may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. And under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. What a powerful poem. Because I'm going to tell you what that poem says. Now he says, I think whatever gods may be, small g, but that was his understanding back then. We know who's in charge of destiny. We know who calls the shots. 
But I love that part at the end that said, I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. You say, well, I'm not, God is, yeah. But God gives you choice, God gives you free will, and God certainly gives you sovereignty over your emotions. God doesn't force your emotions, you have control over them. You are the master of your emotional fate. You're the captain of your emotional soul. You determine how you are. And I'm telling you every day, every day, every day, hallelujah, every day, you can love, you can laugh, you can live. You need to learn to live free from people, free from yourself, because we condemn ourselves so much. We can't even laugh because we're too busy beating up our own selves. Free from people, free from yourself. Free from demonic attacks because all he's trying to do is cause you to doubt anyway and lose your faith. But whenever you're not in faith, you're in doubt, despondency and discouragement. Free from the devil and live for Jesus every day. Hey, 2021, make it an L3 year. Love, laugh, and live. But just share this message. Somebody needs to hear it. Enough, enough of the crap that we've allowed on us in 2020. 2021. 365 days, love. Every day, find a way to love. Don't take it off. Laugh. Have fun and joy. Live. In the process, fear God now. Don't be like Solomon said, I saw. I, I, when I say live, I'm not talking about be up in every club and I'm just going to live. Woo! Let's twerk. No, baby, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about living your life to the full. I'm talking about fearing God and keeping his commandments and expressing yourself and enjoying whatever it is you have. I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about just a carefree, not caring about anybody. When you love, you care about other people. I said love, laugh, and live. Not live and forget about love. So live, laugh, and love every day in 2021. Man, I love you, and I thank God for you. Father, in Jesus' name, give us the grace to do this, Lord. Let it not just be a message. Let it be weighty. Weighty on the hearts of the people that are listening. Weighty on the hearts of those who need it. And I know all of us need it, God. Help us to rise above that. And dominate our lives in the emotional realm. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, hey, listen. I got a question for you. Is Jesus your boss? I'm not talking about some pseudo-religious way. Are you really living for him? Does he have 100% of you? Have you given your life to him so he can forgive your sins and become your substitute? If not, you really, really need to do that. I want you to pray this prayer with me if you have not. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Change me. In Jesus' name, amen. That's all it takes. Just come to him. Those who come to him, he'll in no wise cast out. That prayer is the beginning. It's an introduction. You got to grow. You got to learn to live with him. You got to read the Bible. You got to pray. You got to get with some people that can help you. You're a baby Christian. You're just starting out. You need some help. Check our YouTube channel. There's some videos on there. Where do I go from here? It's just about four or five short videos that tell you what to do and how to pray and how to read the Bible. But get connected with a spiritual family. We'd be very happy to be that in your life. We have a new e-church that's going to launch in January where you can become an e-church uh, member and just be a part of our spiritual family. And great things can begin to happen in your life, I believe, because of it as we partner together. Listen, thank you so much for your prayers for our ministry and all that we do. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your financial contributions. They do so much to help us. We bore so much fruit in 2020, even in the midst of a pandemic. So many people got saved. We had more people impacted by our ministry in 2020 than ever in the history of our ministry. I mean that millions of people have been impacted and people have been touched all over the world. They really have. And you make that possible by your generosity, by your gifts, and by your prayer. I'm so glad you're part of the spiritual family. I love you. I'm praying for you. I decree the best is yet to come. L3, love, laugh, and come on, live. Hey, peace out. I'll see you next time. Now, there are multiple ways that you can stay connected here at Fresh and Winning House of Worship in new and exciting ways. We have a brand new website and app that just launched. Don't forget to check out fayhow.org and download the Fayhow app. All you have to do is search F-A-H-O-W in your Apple Store or Google Play. It is the perfect way to stay connected and up to date on all things going on at Fresh. You can live stream our services, watch previous sermons, and you'll have access to sermon notes and more.
There are multiple ways to give here at Fashion Winning House of Worship. One of those ways is online on our new website, fayhow.org. Just click the Give tab at the top of the homepage. Once there, you will put in your information and verify your phone number. Then you can proceed with your giving. Another way you can give is by texting Fresh Anointing to 77977. You will receive a link that will take you to our Push Pay platform where you can give. We want to encourage you to share this live stream with your friends and family. Also, tell us in the comment section where you're watching from and how this message is impacting you.